Hello, it's Bill, the Knee Pain Guru. Today is Wednesday, February 2nd, 2022. Welcome to the Ask Dr. Beck Show. Welcome, Dr. Beck. Hi, everyone. How are you doing today, Charlie? Um, I'm getting ready for winter to finally hit. Here in yeah. Indiana, the section that we're at, we're supposed to get between uh, 12 and 18 inches of snow over the next 24 hours or so. And I'm, oh, I'm always goodness. looking for an excuse to pull out my snowshoes in Indiana. And this may be one of them. <laughs> 18 inches. Now, have your weather people been accurate this winter? Uh, I don't know because I don't follow it. Oh, okay. My wife is all over it. You know, we're supposed to get this and this. And I'm like, okay, whatever. I mean, it'll happen or it won't. But yeah. but yeah, we're supposed to get 18 inches. Oh, my gosh. They they had done that in, um, well, Western North Carolina. We have lots of mountains and lots of microclimates. And they'll call for like 6 to 12 inches of snow. And everybody shuts down. And we'll get an inch. And it'll only be in like one pocket because it hit a mountain. <laughs> it never yep. got past it. Yeah, yeah. So, anyhow, okay, uh, we have a question that came in on uh, walking post knee replacement. That's actually a subject for today. Okay. The question came in from Beth. I had a knee replacement surgery five weeks ago. I have full flexion and almost full extension. I am suffering from medial knee pain anytime I try to walk. I am becoming quite depressed because I should not need any pain medication at this point. That's all they wrote. Okay. And we went over this last week. You ask better questions, you get better answers. Yeah. So, And, and I will preface this with you are an absolute wealth of knowledge and understanding the body on a level that I would say 1% of 1% of the physicians, yep. osteopaths in the world No, So agreed. There you go. Okay. So um, what <laughs> she is describing, so we'll go with, first of all, medial knee pain post-replacement. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm hearing from the question. Okay. Yes. So if we take out the knee itself and we replace it with artificial something or another, mm -hmm. that artificial something or another has no nerve endings. So what we have to get clear about is that the pain cannot be coming from the parts that were replaced. Got it. Okay. So it has to be coming from something that's original that's still there. Okay. Now, when they go through and they replace the knee, so there are four main ligaments in the knee, the anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments, those are in the center, and the collateral ligaments, those are on the outside. Mm -hmm. They do their best to preserve the collateral ligaments and insert the knee around it. But when they take out the old knee, they take out the anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments. So that would mean, and, and, those ligaments, ligaments are poorly, um, they have poor blood flow, so they're, but they're richly innervated. So they receive a lot of stimulus if something's not right. And so what I'm hearing in this is that the medial collateral ligament, that's the ligament that's on the inside of the knee that connects tibia and fibula, or sorry, tibia and femur. Um, there's something going on in that ligament that is triggering pain. So first thing that I would do is simply treat the knee. Let's see if we can balance the tensions in there, get that ligament to relax, and then the pain may go away. Mm -hmm. um, if that's it, then it, that's a simple fix. So not a big deal. If that is not it, second thing that I would look for is because of the knee surgery, you have had trauma. It has activated the Babinski reflex which makes you walk on the outside of your leg, okay, the, the, the lateral part, and then can put abnormal forces on the inside of the leg, which then can um, change the tension in the ligaments. That's the second mm -hmm. thing I would look for. The third thing I would look for is that when we're putting in a knee as mm -hmm. orthopedic surgeons, um, 
you're basically using a hammer to drive a spiked nail into a bone. Okay. And sometimes that can really um, alter the bone mechanically. Mm -hmm. um, so you can get places where there is stress in the bone and that stress wasn't there before those can also cause issues with pain, which again can be handled during a treatment. Okay. Um, last thing I would do in that case, um, if I were seeing that person and let's just say we're two or three visits in and the pain is not subsiding, then it's possible that that tendon, uh, not the tendon, the ligament, sorry, the medial collateral ligament um, was damaged in some way during the surgery. And so that might be a prolotherapy case. Mm-hmm. Got it. And in your experience in working with patients, people are motivated either by the carrot or the stick. <laughs> They're motivated by the some, something good to happen. Yes. Or the fear of something bad happening. Correct. Um, I, I did an initial Google search on knee replacements and the images are pretty, pretty brutal. Uh, yeah. brutal looking. Um, yes. do you, any, any, uh, feedback from your perspective as maybe knowing that there's another option besides knee replacement, uh, would be a, a carrot for them to look for, or I know we covered that, I believe it was last week. Yeah. We so Um, my, my brain goes to there's a disconnect in the medical system. Mm -hmm. Fixing the disconnect is really what I'm about to describe. Okay. Because as, let's say, as a consumer of health care, which in theory, all of us in America are consumers of health care at some point in our lives. What you should be given is a list of the things that are possible. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we would call that informed choice. That list should include, hey, here's what we do in my specialty, right? Whatever it is, this is what I was trained in. This is what I'm good at. And then here are the other things I know about. Now I may have an opinion on them. It may be a strong opinion, but my opinion should not influence you. Here's just a list of what you can do research on, things that may be able to help. And so that list should include things like uh, massage therapy, acupuncture, osteopathy. It could include um, chanting and waving feathers. Because even if it just works for one person, it has been proven to work. And so what happens is, is that, and this is part of the training in medical school, um, my training was slightly different, but once you become a doctor for many people, doctor equals God, and that could be large God or small God. And so then the mentality is if I don't know about it, it can't work and it can't exist so that when you go to the doctor who has this belief system, and they say, you need knee replacement. What they're really saying is, you need knee replacement, and there is no alternative. Mm -hmm. Because I don't know about it, and because I don't know about it, it can't work. Right. And that is not reality. Um, I mean, people pray, and their bodies change. Mm -hmm. Pain goes away. Cancer goes away. And there have been enough proven cases that that is alternative medicine, just praying. Mm -hmm. um, people have been touched by others and through that touch, their body changes. Mm -hmm. and, and that touch could be someone who has no medical training or it could be chiropractor, massage therapist, physical therapist, someone who is just gifted enough to give your body what it needs at the moment that it needs it. Mm. So, the answer to your question is we need to fix the system so that as a consumer of healthcare, you get full knowledge. Mm -hmm. And then 
we need to get good information out so that you can make informed choices based upon that knowledge. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yep. I mean, makes sense to me. Yep. But then, right. you know, here we are. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, I have a topic we're going to talk about today, magnetic fields from refrigerators. Talk about that a little bit. Okay, so um, big, long, deep rabbit hole. We're going to start going down just a little bit. Okay. Um, so that people can understand a little bit more about what their environment that they live in does for them. Mm. Okay, so we live in a world full of electricity. Yes. Um, it's very hard nowadays to go anywhere in the world where there isn't electricity in some way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. And so what we need to do is we need to understand the science behind it. Electricity is just electrons moving. It comes in two forms, direct current, that is a steady stream of electrons moving, or alternating current, which is a pulsed stream of electrons. Okay. That's it. Don't make it any harder. Um, there's a bunch of history behind it um, with a bunch of famous people, Westinghouse, Tesla, Alexander Graham Bell, all that kind of stuff. But what happens is, is that when we need to convert AC electricity to DC electricity, Mm -hmm. we have to move the voltage up or down. And so we will run it through a transformer. A transformer is an iron core with copper wire wrapped around it. The number of turns determines how far you move it up or down. Mm -hmm. And whenever you use a transformer, a transformer generates electrical current in one small space and electrical current and magnetic fields go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. Mm -hmm. So when we look at motors, motors have, that's Juma in the background, by the way. Um, motors have windings in them and they use electrical power to generate magnetic fields to turn the motor. Mm -hmm. A compressor in a refrigerator is effectively a motor, and it generates a magnetic field. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty powerful motor. And so I'm going to pause there and say your bodies, our bodies as humans, the only magnetic field that we are used to is the Earth's magnetic field. Everything else to us is foreign. Mm -hmm. Because a million years ago, other than lightning, and static electricity, there wasn't anything else. So when you place your body in a magnetic field, that weak magnetic field, it interplays with your nervous system and can really be detrimental. Mm -hmm. So the things that generate these magnetic fields have transformers and or motors in them. So fans, for example, um, TVs and their power supplies, mm -hmm. alarm clocks, um, refrigerators, which is what the, the big thing that we're talking about. It's the biggest thing that you're going to encounter. Mm -hmm. And so all of these magnetic fields dissipate with the square of the distance. Okay. Okay. So, and so that means that if you're really close to it, it's going to be a stronger field. And at some point, you're going to be far enough away from that field where it drops into the background again and it doesn't affect you. Now, the reason I say all this is because it can interfere with sleep. Okay. So we go back to alarm clocks. Alarm clocks are wonderful things. Had one for all of my life. The best alarm clock is the old wind-up Big Ben. It oh, yeah. just goes tick, 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 and it does not generate a magnetic field. But typically today, if you have an alarm clock, it has a power supply and the power supply is going to have a transformer in it. That power supply is going to generate a weak magnetic field. Mm -hmm. So putting that next to your head while you sleep, that is to say on the bedside table, is probably not the wisest choice. 
-hmm. better to have that alarm clock and put it across the bedroom where you can see the time, but because you've moved it farther away, you have a much weaker magnetic field and the magnetic field may be completely gone by the time you move it across the room. Mm -hmm. When we come to refrigerators, when they turn on and they're actually generating cold, the compressor comes on. That compressor, the, when I measured the one that I tested, 15 feet away from the refrigerator was how far the magnetic field went, which is pretty significant when you think about, unless you live in a, a McMansion, right. that covers the whole kitchen. Right. But then depending on where your kitchen is and some homes that I have been in, the wall of the kitchen where the refrigerator sits is on the opposite side of the master bedroom where the bed sits. So every time the compressor comes on, your body is bathed in this magnetic field. Oof. Yeah. Okay. And so it can interrupt sleep. And because we're not taught about this, we weren't even taught in medical school, but because we aren't taught about this, you don't know what to look for. And so you just think that you have bad sleep, whatever. And you may take something for the bad sleep. You may take a sleep medicine. When the cause is this magnetic field coming from your refrigerator or hmm. a, a fan that you put next to your bed, whatever. So the great thing is, is that there are remedies for all of this stuff. Distance okay. is the first thing, right? Distance is easy because it doesn't cost you a penny. Hmm. Um, if distance is not an option, putting your appliance or alarm clock or whatever on a digital or analog timer that actually cuts the electricity off, second option. Now, they make a special plug for a refrigerator that keeps the compressor from coming on when you program the time into it. So, for example, the refrigerator could stay where it's at. Your bedroom could stay where it's at. And you tell the refrigerator to not turn the compressor on when you're sleeping. When you're outside the bedroom, it doesn't matter. You're gone at work or whatever. It doesn't matter if it comes on. Sure. Um, so I have found for myself that do, be, becoming cognizant of these things first and then doing what you can to mitigate them mm -hmm. helps a ton. Mm -hmm. so that's why I wanted to bring it up um, so that we could talk about it just a little bit and we can continue to go down the rabbit hole on further additions um, because there's lots of stuff to learn about electromagnetism and what it does to the body, both beneficially and detrimentally. Yeah. Uh, that's great. We actually did an interview with the um, pain education podcast. Uh -huh. uh, his name was, um, that's escaping me right now, but he was talking about the electromagnetic fields generated by the um, wireless routers. Yes. Uh, in, throughout the house. Yes. And his real, uh, you know, down and dirty basic solution was one of those analog timers yep. that shut off between certain hours. Yes. And um, I have... I set that up and I have since gotten away from that yeah. practice. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, uh, it, I, I don't know if I gave it enough time to really notice the difference. Cause there's element, there's levels of that. There's the router then there's also the cell phone and then sure. there's the alarm clock and then there's the refrigerator. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, we yeah. just keep going on and on and on. I got about uh, six or seven years ago. I was asked to do a one hour presentation on, the detrimental effects of EMFs, electromagnetic forces on the body. Mm -hmm. And I spent nine months, pretty much every day, reading, taking classes, whatever, going down the rabbit hole. My first statement to them, the very first sentence was, in this hour that I have, I cannot scare you enough about how much this adversely affects the body. Yeah. And so when I was reading through it, it suggested, like you said, <laughs> Wi-Fi, this frequency range of electromagnetic energy, mm. it stimulates the nervous system. 
And so it is, you could theoretically walk through it. Like if you were walking through a building, eh, not a big deal. Um, but living in it is not good. Right. And so for me, every single night at 3 a.m., plus or minus five minutes, I would be awake, like uh -huh. sleeping, and then boom, I am up. Yeah. And I was up for an hour and consistently every night. Mm -hmm. And so I'm reading all of this and I'm like, huh, I wonder if my Wi-Fi is the problem. I wonder if it could be. And so I unplugged it one night, mm -hmm. slept the whole night through. Wow. And I'm like, oh, wait a minute. Well, no, that, that, that can't be. That's too coincidental. Right. Plug the Wi-Fi back in, up at three. I'm like, um, okay. So unplugged the Wi-Fi again, slept the whole night through. Mm -hmm. And it I tested it over and over again, and it was consistent, right? And then I put the Wi-Fi on a timer, and I got a digital one, not a big deal. And so set it up where it goes off, I don't know, let's say 15 minutes past what our normal bedtime was. That way, you know, you could be watching TV and doing whatever. And then it would stay off and it would come on about, I don't know, 10 minutes before you wake up. So that everything was booted and you could wake up and check in on the world if you wanted to. Right. And so I sleep pretty darn well. Except when my wife doesn't sleep and she gets up during the night and unplugs the timer and plugs the system in. Oh. And then doesn't remember to plug the timer back in. So the system stays on. And after, you know, a night or two of waking up at 3 a.m., I'm like, honey, is there something going on? Yeah. <laughs> and she says, oh, yeah. Yeah, there is. Let me go fix that. And yeah. then sleep returns again. Hmm. So it's very interesting how um, electrosensitivity can influence people. And we all have it to some degree. Some have it in huge amounts. And others just have tiny bits. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like uh, different people have different adaptabilities to the influence of those. Yes. Uh, that electricity in their life or in their body. Yeah. Uh, oh, we got a question that came in. Uh, by the way, if you have any questions for Dr. Beck, you can submit that in the live chat. You can also go to the Camella Foundation dot org and in the upper right hand corner you can check out the ask dr beck uh button there which will take you in to be able to ask a question let's see that here oh it's a russian bot <laughs> Go for it. Right. they have a question <laughs> well it's not in english <laughs> But no, there, there's some sort of code that I'm not quite sure what it is, but they, some sort of, it, there's a, just one of the letters is a live link. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not quite sure what that is, but anyhow, it's like, oh, a question? No, it's not. Okay. All right. Uh, so there is that. Well, let me play a little promo thing. There we go. We'll do this real quick and then we'll wrap it up. Our mission at the Camella Foundation is to relieve pain naturally using osteopathic healing principles. The Camella Foundation is recognized as a nonprofit 501c3 under the Internal Revenue Code. Your contributions are greatly appreciated. Please consider taking a moment and donating to the Camella Foundation to help us continue our important pain relieving work. Every little bit helps. And we're back. Awesome. Cool. Are, do you think we'll dive in deeper on this, um, on the electro magnetic? Sure. Oh, yeah. 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 Thing? Or did you want to do a, um, should we do a pain education podcast on it? Did, would a, a longer venue make it? I mean, either way we could, we could do probably more than one podcast on it talking okay. about, um, the different aspects of it, or we could include little bits with every podcast, whichever works easier for people being able to find it. Okay. Uh, might be easier if we did it. Um, we'll talk offline on that. Sure. And dig into that and figure out a format. Okay. Well, we're going to wrap it up for today. 
Uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for Absolutely. your time. Uh, this is Bill Paravano, the knee pain guru. Uh, thank you for your questions and everything, everyone uh, contributing to the show. <sighs> We're going to wrap it up for this week. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, thank you, everyone. Have a great one, and uh, yeah. we'll see you next week. Take care.